This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. It's Fun Friday. My name is Jeff Sandu. The only way is up. That's been the mantra of people like, well, MSP's Matt Armitage on this show forever. More people, more food, less land, higher buildings. But up isn't the only way. Could the future of humanity really be down? Matt, you're taking the idea of a downbeat topic very literally, I see. Hey, Jeff. Well, you know, like you said, we keep being told that building up is the only way to do things, mm. that we have to cram more people into fewer buildings until we get to the point where we can do, you know, low earth orbit launches from the roof of our condo. Um, but humans have been building downwards ever since the dwarf mines in <laughs> Lord of the Rings. And you do know that isn't real, right? It is. I've seen the documentaries. <laughs> they're, they're really detailed. They even have maps. Mm. Um, you know, Underground communities get a really bad reputation. You know, we associate them with the people that uh, societies have forgotten about, you mm. know, the homeless people, the sick, the poor, and, of course, all the assassins that come after John Wick. Again, not real. It is. It's a docuseries. <laughs> it just, it's a coincidence that the guy looks remarkably like Keanu Reeves. Um, <laughs> anyway, we can agree to differ. We really can't. The point is that we associate underground with these end of the world type scenarios. So uh, in one of my favorite not reality shows, The 100. You're sure that's not real too? No, it's completely unrealistic because it's um, <laughs> it's set in the future and there aren't any Apple stores. Right. So it couldn't possibly be <laughs> the actual future. Uh, Whenever you see a community going underground, it's always for some terrible reason, mm. um, like the impending destruction of the world. In fact, pretty much it's always the impending <laughs> destruction of the world. Mm. That's the only reason. It's just the underlying causes that change. It might be to do with uh, climate disaster, war, societal collapse. But this idea of going underground, it seems to signify the, the end of something. Mm, and we do have a history of building underground. Uh, yeah, of course. You know, that's as old as civilization, really. So the inspiration for today's show, it came from a Rockefeller Foundation article that I read in The Guardian back in December uh, by a writer called Bradley L. Garrett. Now, lots of societies have underground tunnels and networks, and this goes back, you know, literally millennia. Um, Paris has its system of ancient catacombs, and mm. uh, many more modern cities are littered with old and unused transport tunnels. And there are all of those military and defence spaces on top of that as well. Uh, some of the stations on Moscow's metro line can be sealed against uh, nuclear and chemical attack, mm. for example. And of course, you know, the 20th century in general saw a spike in building these underground fortresses, um, bomb shelters for the various never-ending wars. And of course, there was also a boom in private shelter building that came about during the Cold War. Uh, people wanted, you know, their own underground nuclear fallout bunkers. It seems weird to talk about it now. <laughs> um, because, you know, they believed that it was inevitable that there would be this nuclear conflict, this mutually assured destruction that would bring the end mm. of the world. And of course, more recently, we've seen the rise of the uh, survivalist and kind of doomsday preppers movement. Mm. Do you have a bug out bag? I'm um, just my passport and obviously my charm. Um, <laughs> plus, you know, a very cute cat that nobody could uh, deny asylum to. Um, and I have a lot of toilet paper because mm. apparently maintaining your bathroom hygiene is the key to surviving <laughs> any apocalypse. You know, so building down gets this very bad reputation, but it does have a lot of practical uses. Uh, there are two famous underground networks in Canada. There's the uh, RESO, the RESO in Montreal, mm -hmm. and uh, the PATH network in Toronto. Uh, Singapore has huge mm -hmm. underground networks, and it's actually planning a lot of further developments, which we will talk about later. Even Sydney has gotten in on the action. Um, in the early to mid-20th century, Sydney siders seem to be obsessed with building tunnels for just about any reason you could imagine, for taking coal down to rivers. You know, for it's like, OK, let's build a tunnel. Um, <laughs> then, of course, there's, you know, Cooba PD, which is the Australian uh, desert town in South Australia, where most of the residents actually live underground mm. because the homes are 
blasted out of the rock um, because the rock acts as a, a climate control system that keeps them at a stable temperature all year round. So weather plays a huge part. Yeah, I mean, if you take Canada, you know, obviously Canada gets very cold in winter. If you want to dash out from your desk at work to, to grab a sandwich, you don't necessarily want to put on full Arctic survival <laughs> gear just to step out. You know, you want to head somewhere that's well lit, mm. heated, so you essentially want a sprawling underground mall, yeah. somewhere where you can just go to pick up some food. So the path system in downtown Toronto um, has actually been evolving since about 1900 when uh, the first buildings and hotels started to link up underground. But in 1950s, the city planners realized that it was actually a great democratizing space for the financial district. Uh, so a walkway to uh, link buildings and travel points uh, in the, the financial district is what it started off as. But it's also become a, a way to create space for retailers that were being squeezed out of the surface level, the ground floor retail space, by all these big fancy company headquarters and tower blocks. Mm, how big are we talking here? Well, Path is actually pretty extensive. There are uh, around 30 kilometres of passageways. Um, there's 75 buildings that have been linked by it. Um, there are actually 1,200 uh, retail outlets, that's shops, cafes, restaurants, and it generates around 1.7 billion Canadian dollars in sales every year. Mm. And it's very idiosyncratic. Uh, until recently, you actually needed to know it in order to <laughs> navigate it. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> so it wasn't for the faint-hearted or people who were new to the city, uh, because a lot of the navigation, um, which you know you, you sometimes see in Singapore as well, the navigation goes building to building yeah. rather than landmark to landmark. Um, so despite the fact that it's called path, it wouldn't necessarily take you along the same paths as the streets above. And that doesn't sound very useful. I mean, it is and it isn't. Um, <laughs> as a way of getting about, maybe not. But you should see them as actually different worlds. Um, mm. A lot of the retailers, especially the independent ones, feared they'd lose trade if the navigation became this very straight A to B. And the same with some of the buildings. You know, they feared they'd be relegated to you know the pathways less trodden so they'd become less relevant they'd get fewer tenants and they'd start to lose money so while some users want it to be direct and simple others appreciate that it's essentially a separate city underneath the uh, streets of toronto yeah. with a different set of purposes and actually a different set of uh, with a different geography i'm glad that you actually mentioned purpose unless this is an infomercial for toronto not at all. I'm sure Toronto <laughs> is great. Um, I've never been, but the sake of balance, uh, uh, other cities are available. You know, we're talking about this because building underground was seen as a bit old hat, you know, a bit gloomy. As mm -hmm. I mentioned before, it brought up or brings up that image of bomb shelters and the Cold War. So you're here to show us the shiny new future of building underground. Uh, do you want the good news or the bad news? Um, <laughs> yes, there is a shiny new future element, but there's also an interesting but more downbeat one. So I mentioned the uh, preppers movement before. Mm. Now, that used to be really niche, this kind of survivalist movement. And in fact, I think I did an episode on survival technology here on BFM with Frida back in our pre-MSP days. There was a time before MSP? You know, I actually dream of a future where world calendars reset to the uh, the first date of this show. You know, we should remember everything as BMSP before Matt's blamed. Uh, everything was boring and worthless and everything AMSP after Matt's blamed. You know, you, you get the symbolism. Yeah. Everything was suddenly shiny and new and full of purpose. <laughs> you really aren't very well, are you? I'm actually as well as uh, can be expected, my doctor says. Um, as long as I take my life-size cut out of Jeff Sandu everywhere I go for emotional support, I'm absolutely fine. Um, he looks really handsome standing in the aisles on planes. Um, I have had a couple of rideshare drivers cancel on me when they reach the, uh, the curbside. Uh, and for some reason, some restaurants won't give him his own place. Oh, sitting. rude and mean. Anyways, forget underground. This show is going underwater. Okay, um, back to the preppers then. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the latest thing in science fiction. It's actually called climate fiction. Um, mm. But there's a subgenre of that. Um, according to Wired magazine, it's been termed Doomer Lit. So authors like Jeanette Winterson, Claire V. Watkins and Jenny Offill um, and pretty much any TV show or movie that I <laughs> yeah, watch. It, sounds like it. Um, it, it echoes people who understand that we're at risk from uh, climate change, from money politics, and it takes the view that that 
we're doomed and there's nothing much that we can do about so it's it. So it's a bit like this show then. No, no, no. It's actually way less happy than me. Um, you know, it really is that kind of fiddling while um, bones approach or, or, or partying while the fire festival fizzles, if you want a, a gen digital <laughs> friendly example. So the, the prepper movement has gone mainstream. There's serious money flowing into it. Uh, people who are willing to spend lavish amounts to survive the end of the world. And after the break, we'll take a look at some of the things that they're building and investing in, as well as looking at some of those, as I said, shiny and more utopian examples. Anyways, for the first time, I don't even know if we're coming back after the break. If you hear digging sounds, it's probably going to be Matt tunneling under your house or building. We'll be right back, BFM 89.9. Busy finding money. BFM 89.9. And we're back. It is Fun Friday. My name is Jeff Sander together with Culture Pop's Matt Armitage. During the break, I managed to drag Matt out of his tunnel to finish the show. We are talking about the downward trajectory of humanity's future today, by which I mean living underground. So is this the Kimmy Schmidt part of the show? Weirdly, another of my favourite documentaries. <laughs> um, you know, that a man who looked so much like John Hamm could keep a group of women prisoner in a bunker for years at a time is absolutely astonishing to me. Um, but yes, you know, the West especially has this, you know, huge glut of Cold War bunkers. Mm. Uh, a lot of them were decommissioned or in some cases they were just too old and run down. Uh, and the same governments have been building newer, stronger and, of course, more modern facilities with all the kind of uh, new technology command and control uh, structures built in. When you say bunker, what do you mean? Of course, I'm sure a lot of people have an idea of it's just some cramped hole in the ground with bunk beds and a couple of dozen people. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the popular example. Mm. You know, you, there's a, a door <laughs> at the top and you go down the steps and it's just like this horrible, depressing scene. But there are actually um, quite a large number of locations that have been uh, sold or are for sale across the world that are much bigger in scale. Mm. Um, decommissioned missile silos, for example, that can be 50 to 100 metres in depth. Uh, in 2016, the British government put a, a site called Burlington up for sale. Now, that was formerly the central government war headquarters, and it was uh, located essentially in its own town outside the city of Bath. Now, Burlington was a, a complex that Britain's politicians, the, the government could retreat to and used as a fortified seat of government if London or other parts of the country were mm. attacked. And it's enormous. It can shelter 4,000 people for up to three months. So it's less of a bunker and more of an underground town. Totally. I mean, it's built on a 35-acre site. It's wow. about 80 metres down. It has sleeping quarters, uh, hospitals, industrial kitchens, civilian radio broadcasting facilities, libraries, laundries, offices, meeting spaces. <laughs> it even has its own dedicated underground rail links. Uh -oh. So it's got its own rail station going in and out. Uh, it's got its own water reservoir in addition to filtration systems. So if Toronto's path sounds big at 30 kilometres, there are almost 100 kilometres of underground roads in the Burlington complex. And how much was this on the market for? A literal bargain basement <laughs> price of three million pounds. I mean, that's hardly enough for a decent three-bedroom house in central London these days. <laughs> in the end, they didn't actually sell it. Mm -hmm. um, they had interested buyers, but it was taken off the market. Nobody really knows why, but it's thought that perhaps it was because it's on the heritage register. So that makes redeveloping it um, very kind of problematic. Mm. I want to know, what would you turn it into? Well, remember I said earlier that there's big money in the prepper industry these days. So a company in the US called Terra Vivos actually buys up old US Army facilities. So uh, one of the things it's bought and developed is called uh, Camp Igloo. It's in a remote part of South Dakota. The development's called Vivos X Point, and it claims that it's the largest survivalist community in the world. And it absolutely dwarves the uh, UK's Burlington complex. It claims to be about three quarters the size of Manhattan Island wow. in New York. Yeah. Um, admittedly, it's not uh, fully underground. They're actually earth-covered concrete domes. So I guess they're a bit like, you know, military hobbit houses. Lord of the Rings again. I mean, I told you it was a documentary. <laughs> um, 
X point consists of 575 bunkers. Uh, they're eight meters wide. They're 18 to 25 meters in length. They have four meter ceilings and each can accommodate comfortably uh, around 20 people. And they must be expensive. They're actually surprisingly affordable. Uh, they're 35,000 US dollars for a bunker, <laughs> plus an annual maintenance charge of $1,000. That's if you get the empty bunker that you outfit yourself. Mm. Uh, you'll spend more money, of course, if you want Terra Vios to custom uh, rig out the inside for you. But the company even suggests something it calls bunker glamping. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah, bringing your family for hunkered oh. down vacations. So I look forward to that listing <laughs> on Airbnb. <laughs> Um, interestingly, it also offers bunk space in its own kitted out bunkers. And they're really plush, you know, flat screen mm, TVs mm. and everything. You can get a bunk space for $60 per person mm. for uh, per month. Presumably, there are more high end versions. Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, billionaires don't want to mix with <laughs> the kind of people who can afford their own $35,000 bunker, <laughs> you know, especially at the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. They want something, you know, more exclusive, more of a glittering social life. Um, like one of those missile silos that I mentioned before. Mm. So there's the survival condo in Kansas, which uh, contains a mixture of uh, full, half floor and penthouse units in a 15-storey missile silo. Penthouse? No, I don't get it either. I mean, maybe you get a better class of earthworm outside the <laughs> penthouse windows. Um, but, you know, this is the full deluxe setup. Mm. The baths in the units are jacuzzi equipped in case you need bubbles to soothe away the, the, the pain of the apocalypse. <laughs> Uh, there's a communal pool, spa, shooting range. There's a climbing wall. I mean, you would put a climbing wall in a missile silo, right? Uh, there's a grocery store, medical units. There's even a shooting range. And the prices for those units range from about one and a half to four and a half million US dollars. Now, you mentioned that it's not only death and disaster that are causing underground communities and structures to proliferate. No, I mean, we'll mention some of the new builds in a minute. Um, I just wanted to, to mention Beijing because mm -hmm. Beijing has a, a massive underground complex of shelters and bunkers that is called the Underground City. Uh, it was built in the 1960s and 70s by citizen volunteers at a time when it looked like nuclear war between China and the Soviet Union was, you know, quite likely. Mm. The relations between the two was very poor. No one actually knows how extensive the networks or tunnels and shelters are because, you know, a lot of them link up to sensitive government installations as well. But the underground city is thought to be home to as many as 100,000 people. Wow. And they're actually known in the city as the Rat Tribe. Mm. And the conditions underground run the, the whole range from, you know, if not opulent, then at least well-maintained to, to people who are unfortunately squatting in filthy and uh, dangerous conditions. But, you know, there are shops and businesses down there as well as residents. Uh, and the Beijing authorities seem to alternate between evicting residents without warning to this kind of ongoing condition of benign indifference. Hmm. So you think down is the way up for Asia? Well, thankfully, it's not my view because I get <laughs> accused of being a neo-colonialist as it is. Um, and that's completely unfair because I'd be happy to rule over absolutely anyone and everyone. Um, you know, I'd be a very politically correct tyrant. Uh, Singapore is certainly addressing some of its land use problems by heading underground. Um, anyone who has uh, visited the city's uh, city knows it already has, you know, this marvellous network of tunnels mm. and underground plazas. And it feels like you can visit most of the malls and buildings on Orchard Road <laughs> without ever having to put your head into uh, any kind of fresh air. So what's the plan for Singapore? Well, it's, it's kind of twofold at the moment. Um, firstly, the, the, the plans are a signalling mechanism to developers. So by creating a blueprint of future underground buildings, Singapore can better control what actually happens on the surface. Developers know what kind of uh, use the surface land can be put to, how far down they can excavate for pilings, that kind of thing. But also they have an idea of how the infrastructure on the island will evolve over the next few decades and how their buildings can complement or tap into or build on that vision. We're not talking about underground residential developments here. No, no, absolutely not, for reasons we'll get to shortly. So the idea is actually to move a lot of the utilities and services underground. So, for example, the new electricity substation in Pasir Panjang is being built underground. Mm. Uh, that means three hectares of uh, land on the surface can be used for other purposes. Uh, potentially other land-intensive facilities like... Um, Industrial plants, entire factories could be moved underground. In residential areas, community facilities, shops, restaurants 
could be moved underground as well. So you free up more space for all kinds of things, potentially even more community green spaces. And that's just for the the shallow underground stuff. Mm. There are also plans for deeper excavations, which could be used for storage purposes. So you could uh, put your uh, hydrocarbons underground, your gas and oil, and other kind of um, public goods could be stored underground. Mm. Do you see other cities following suit? Well, obviously, you know, Singapore is a really extreme case because the country is so limited Mm. geographically. Um, And, you know, maybe Johor residents should listen out for shovels in case the tunneling (laughs) comes a little too far under the water. Mm. You know, obviously, I'm joking, but um, it's not a surprise that Singapore would be a pioneer in this kind of urban development. And its learnings may turn out to be a model for other city states like Hong Kong, but also for towns and cities that don't want to kind of encroach on the surrounding countryside or or farming land um, around them. Mm. Other than the survivalist complexes, we haven't really talked about the possibility of people living underground. Well, again, I think this is something that the planners in Singapore are acutely aware of. So studies since the 1960s have shown that we don't fare well living for extended periods underground. Unlike the dwarves in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, unfortunately, (laughs) we don't seem to have any remnants of their Mm. DNA, so we can't check what made them so suited to this life of tunnelling. So all we have are the books and films that their chronicler (laughs) Tolkien left behind for us. But yes, you know, living underground seems to exert serious emotional and mental pressures on us, as anyone listening to me right now can uh, imagine. (laughs) Um, You know, we become less focused. It becomes harder to concentrate. um, We become more prone to conditions like depression. So the social order and social fabric are likely to come apart quite rapidly unless we have some kind of access to, you know, the world with the sun Mm. and the sky and the stars and the rain in it. So in the case of a country like Singapore, residential facilities are going to be the last thing that you start to move away from the surface. And that doesn't have great implications for the underground preppers? No. So even the um, promotional materials for the Point X bunker complex we talked about earlier, they don't portray it as being a long-term solution. It's a way to, you know, to hunker down in the immediate aftermath or just before this kind of cataclysm. Even if you then use this kind of community as a base, you're not encouraged to stay down there, you know, Mm. buttoned up for the long term. It's a short term solution for calamities we hope will never happen. Uh, And the the other community we talked about. The silo with the penthouse. Yeah. uh, Although, you know, the whirlpool baths are maybe a step (laughs) too far. The rest of the facilities actually make a lot of sense. If you're looking at extended periods living underground, You'd want your life to carry on as close to to Mm. normality as possible. You'd want to eat nice food. You'd want to go for a swim or a walk or a workout. You'd want to be able to socialize. You'd want to be able to go to a cinema and watch a movie. You know, you maintain that sense that there is going to be hope, that there will be a way out. And that's also why Beijing's rat tribe are such an important model for researchers. You want to treat them as lab rats? No, actually precisely the opposite. (laughs) You know, as I said, Beijing authorities seem quite conflicted with what to do with the system and how to maintain the complexes. Studies could actually provide the path for decisive action. You know, how can the the complex be made livable for uh, residents, not just structurally, but in terms of their social welfare? Should residents be given space to live above ground, for example, and then businesses and other community services be moved underground instead? You know, it might sound like we're approaching life the way insects do, but we face growing land management pressures. Some people might even say a crisis where climate change is forcing people into much smaller habitable spaces. We need to figure out how we can live and how we can live well in these areas, how we can still feed ourselves and, you know, stop the planet from wiping us out as it attempts to recover. Mm, There you go. Uh, Actually, I had some experience uh, when I was in Montreal. Um, There was, you know, the underground network itself. Ah, So you could buy groceries, go and watch a movie during winter. You don't even have to, you could just wear shorts and t-shirt and still be in in normal conditions. One of the the articles I read, they used the example of uh, in the middle of winter, um, the the author just sees the same guy in a t-shirt and cargo shorts (laughs) day in, day out, while the temperatures are kind of minus 30 outside. Yeah, exactly. I, I would like to know like those people who work 
in you know that underground outlets and stuff how do they feel like have their change like body change because well yeah also i mean even even like kl examples like klcc yeah, there are some yeah. of those underground <laughs> stores as well and even anyone who works in a mall yeah. there aren't outdoor windows you do wonder what kind of mm. effect it has on their you know on their mind mm. the, the the future could be underground well uh stay tuned we've got geek squawks after this bfm 89.9 Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.